destruction. We cannot harm those for whom we have empathy. The killer, the torturer, must first convince himself that his cruelty is in the name of a greater good, a glorious act of cleansing and purification. The demonization of others is less about the reality of the victim and more about the needs of the perpetrator. It is often no more than a projection of his own fragile self-image. As Jean-Paul Sartre famously said, if the Jew did not exist, the anti-Semite would invent him. Scapegoating has little regard for the facts. It begins with a convenient myth that repeated enough times becomes the incontestable truth. But translating hatred into real violence, motivating the executioners of genocide, brings with it the problem of visceral identification with human suffering. I must say that our men who took part in these executions suffered more from nervous exhaustion than those who had to be shot. These were the words of Paul Lobo, the commander of Einsatzgruppe C. This was the notorious unit responsible for the mass execution of some 34,000 Jews in the Babi Yar ravine near Kiev, the largest single massacre of the Second World War. Now a defendant before the US military tribunal at Nuremberg, he complained that while the victims were somehow resigned to their fate, their executioners experienced a lot psychologically. His co-defendant, Otto Ohlendorf, a former commander of Einsatzgruppe B, also felt sorry for his soldiers who suffered from emotional distress. He testified that the mobile gas vans were introduced for the psychological well-being of the SS troops, to make things easier for them. But it turned out that shooting the victims next to mass, next to mass graves was better, after all, because unloading the asphyxiated corpses from the vans resulted in what he called unnecessary mental strain. It was understandably difficult for those SS troops who were devoted family men at home to murder women and children in cold blood at work, even if it was for the greater good of the so-called master race. Alcohol consumption could ease the pain, but the reality was that the men of the Einsatzgruppen were often traumatized and many had nervous breakdowns. They needed Himmler's comforting reassurance that they were decent, honorable men doing the dirty work of exterminating lice, of contributing to human betterment. Extreme violence is impossible without hate propaganda. Such hatred, though, is instrumental, not impulsive. We may feel deep-seated resentment towards others, but the transformation of such impulses into an instrument of systemic violence, far from being a spontaneous crime of passion, requires careful premeditation and planning. Collective demonization requires considerable skill and effort, a toxic, sophisticated blend of suggestions, innuendo, distortions, half-truths, and outright lies, poisoning the public discourse. It needs to be inspired, learned, expressed, and perfected like a perverse art form. More so than anywhere else, Rwanda's demonologists showcased their talents on RTLM radio. In 1990, the literacy rate in Rwanda was 58%, and up to 95% of the population lived in rural areas. The efficient, industrialized extermination of the Nazi concentration camps was not an option in Rwanda. Killing a million people in every corner of this impoverished country using crude weapons required a highly organized grassroots army of enthusiastic executioners. The Hutu extremist conspiracy thus had to found a way, find a way to mobilize the masses. Come and rejoice, friends. God is merciful. It 
was a happy song, and for Rwandans, radio was the voice of God. Come and rejoice, friends, cockroaches are no more. RTLM had been established on July 8, 1993, just one month before the Arusha uh, peace agreement was signed. It was the mouthpiece of Hutu power, a toxic combination of entertainment and incitement that normalized vicious hatred among ordinary people. Everyone in Rwanda had a small radio. People listened all the time, everywhere, in offices and markets, cafes and bars, taxis and streets. With an appealing talk show format that invited callers to participate, something new for Rwandans, the RTLM broadcasts became highly popular. They were a focus of social life, like a daily conversation among people sharing the latest gossip over a bottle of banana beer. The genocide understood well the tremendous potential of a popular radio program to brainwash the masses, to blur the lines between fact and fiction. The era of internet false news had yet to arrive. The radio was still the best means of deception. Dawn is when the day breaks. When that, when that day comes, we will be heading for a brighter future, for the day when we will be able to say there isn't a single cockroach left in the country. That will only be possible if we continue exterminating them at the same pace. The date was June 5, 1994. For two months, the slaughter had continued unabated. Dispensing with the subtle demonization prior to April 6, RTLM broadcasts now openly call for wiping out Tutsis. The propaganda had been a slippery slope. The boundary between extreme hatred and extreme violence had suddenly collapsed. The Tutsi were now blamed as the authors of their own misfortune, as a suicidal minority that was finally getting what it deserved. By this time, popular announcers like Kantano Habimana were even using the radio to issue instructions for the murder of specific individuals. At every roadblock, the inter could be seen machete in one hand and a radio in the other, minds poisoned, ready to kill. RTLM was Hutu power's not-so-secret weapon of mass destruction. How else could the genocide have mobilized the multitude to extinguish so many lives in so little time? General Dalek's last-minute call for UN reinforcements had fallen on deaf ears. But there had been a much simpler solution if those in the corridors of power had acted earlier. That solution was shutting the RTLM radio broadcasts in the months before the genocide. Without RTLM, it would have been impossible to mobilize the masses necessary for carrying out the killings. For those concerned with freedom of expression, it bears reminding that international human rights law requires the prohibition of hate speech, let alone incitement to genocide. The early warning signs of an impending calamity were there from 1992 onwards. It didn't require much imagination to realize where things were headed. There was a realistic and cost-effective solution at hand. The problem was that for world leaders, Rwanda simply didn't matter. The problem isn't that radical evil is unstoppable. The problem is that we usually don't care about hatred and violence until and unless it affects us directly. The solutions are there, but the political will is missing. And political will is either born of empathy for those that suffer, or self-preservation for the dark forces that we've ignored come back to haunt us. There are plenty of innovative ideas and theories. In the UN jargon, we speak about the responsibility to protect civilians against atrocities, R2P, as it is called, a Canadian invention. But we often confuse 
the proliferation of terminology with genuine progress. Cutting edge concepts, the recycling of liberal cliches are not a substitute for meaningful action. The problem, it seems, is that the self-contained universe of elites is disconnected from the reality of human suffering. Combined with public indifference, it is a guarantee of inaction. Unless there is a deeper conscience motivating decisions, the willingness to act will depend on the cynical cost-benefit calculus of geopolitical interests. Empathy will always find a solution. Apathy will always find an excuse. In this context, listening to the voices of survivors reflecting on their stories of suffering isn't a surfeit of sentimentality. It is a reminder of the catastrophic 